For four years, the American left happily criticized former President Donald Trump's immigration policy, from wearing abolished ICE t-shirts to demonstrating in the streets. But according to journalist Lee Fong, now that border is seeing a record surge in migration. Democrats might find themselves in a bind. The mayor of El Paso, Texas, has warned the city is experiencing a flow of 1,200 migrants per day and is at its breaking point. But Biden is welcoming more migrants and has granted legal work status to nearly 500,000 Venezuelans who have entered the United States over the past two years, Lee Fong reports. But it was not long ago that Biden served as vice president in the Obama administration, which, quote, exceeded records for deportations, hitting three million removals. Back then, Biden champ championed greater surveillance at the border, including a, quote, massive $46 million border security reform that passed the Senate in 2013. A recent Washington Post-ABC News poll found that 62 percent of Americans disapprove of Biden's actions on immigration. Joining us now to discuss is investigative journalist Lee Fong. Welcome back, Lee. Hey, thanks for having me. So we're talking about this just after uh, Mexican President AMLO uh, blamed U.S. sanctions on Cuba and Venezuela for much of the surge, uh, pointing out, he said, quote, that's why we are, we're going to keep insisting on addressing the root causes of migration. The origins go deep. Stop politicking, thinking rights are above ideology, that sanctions cannot be maintained, blockades, and that the poorest countries have to be helped. What do you make of that framing? And what in the alternative do you think is the root of the crisis? Uh, well, there are many factors contributing. Personally, I, I, I agree uh, with this diagnosis from AMLO. Uh, the Trump era sanctions on Venezuela appear to not be working in terms of uh, dislodging Maduro and his party. Um, it's, there's really no evidence that I see that these sanctions are creating political change in Venezuela, but they are creating lots of economic misery. And they are, this, these sanctions are contributing to the migrant crisis with so many people fleeing Venezuela and, and making their way eventually across the border. So, you know, I, just to be clear, you know, there, there are many factors for the, the border crisis. Uh, one of them certainly is um, the sanctions on Venezuela that, that really should be lifted on humanitarian grounds and even um, on political grounds that uh, this is something that is affecting both Democrats and Republicans and we can all kind of get behind of uh, maybe reducing the flow of migrants by reducing these sanctions. It seems that most people support uh, common sense immigration reform. Elon Musk was just at the border this past week with Representative Tony Gonzalez, and his approach was essentially, you know, there are some people who are very responsible, who want to come to the United States, who mean well, they want to work hard, and he said we should let them in. There should be an expedited legal process to do so. It seems that there's pretty widespread support for common sense immigration reform. Of course, mainstream Democrats made a meal out of this when Donald Trump was president. I remember working the Iowa caucuses and there were displays of cages with little baby dolls in them to explain his policy of, you know, the detainment of families, young children and babies at the border, which is something that continued under President Biden. We've also seen more migrants than ever coming from uh, Haiti and being denied at the border under the Biden administration and being deported under the Biden administration. So how close do you think we are to ever getting any concrete, common sense immigration policy from the Democrats or Republicans? I, I don't see any prospect because the politics have been poisoned and both sides are to blame here. Uh, the Democrats uh, in some ways overreacted under Trump. Um, they took policies that Democrats have long supported uh, for decades and demonized them as, uh, you know, examples of racism and, and, and fascism, you know, interior uh, immigration enforcement, uh, the detainers that allow cooperation between local police and ICE officials, uh, you know, simply securing the southern border. I mean, these are things that, uh, mainstream and left-wing Democrats have supported historically. Uh, but because of uh, the reaction to Trump, these policies were demonized and polarized uh, by Democrats. Now, of course, Republicans deserve perhaps uh, equal amounts of, of blame because under the Obama administration, as Obama increased interior uh, enforcement and, and cooperation with police, you know, he, he backed in his second term this big compromise on immigration reform radically increasing enforcement, including uh, radically increasing border security in exchange for a eventual pathway 
uh, for legalization for some 10 million or so undocumented immigrants. Um, it's kind of a classic Washington compromise, both sides um, ha- being forced to recognize the others, uh, the other side's uh, demands, um, both sides giving up something. Um, and of course, this, this passed the Senate uh, with, with bipartisan support, but the, the Tea Party caucus, if that's what it was called then uh, 10 years ago, the, the kind of more radical right, uh, killed this bill. Um, written, and, and killing this bill really kind of fueled the flames that eventually allowed the rise of Trump uh, a few years later in this kind of e- extreme reaction to anything regarding like, accepting refugees or, or migrants. And, and that's kind of led to the cycle that where, we're, we're at, where we are now, where Biden is in a bind. He can't talk about the traditional forms of enforcement and security that Democrats always have. He can only talk about really um, welcoming uh, migrants. Uh, you know, he's, he's provided these 500,000 uh, work permits to, to Venezuelan migrants. Uh, and that, that hasn't stopped the flow. I mean, we're, we're seeing a humanitarian and political crisis at the border with 10,000 migrants re- arriving in, in a single week and an Eagle Pass, you know, 1,000 per day, over 1,000 per day in El Paso, state of emergency in D.C., New York, and Chicago, and other places as migrants just uh, uh, flow across the border. I mean, I think part of what's so frustrating is that even accepting the most maximalist view of what some conservatives would like to do, um, ignore our amnesty laws, um, do a remain in Mexico policy, uh, keep shipping plane loads of migrants back to uh, the, their countries of origin over and over again, there still is not significant incentive to keep people who are facing the level of danger to their physical bodies and economic danger as well from making the attempt. Making the attempt to walk across the length of Mexico and four rivers and, and engage in all of the dangerous activities that they are doing, engaging in, often with young children, is an act of desperation in the first instance. So absent presenting someone with extreme desperation, the likes of which maybe some Republicans do want as they put those uh, razor blade uh, machines in the, in the Rio Grande, they're going to keep trying. So it does really seem like we're going to go round and round in circles until there's an acknowledgement of getting at the root causes, which is why I opened this conversation by asking about sanctions, which have demonstrably worsened the economic conditions in the country of origin of some of the largest uh, migrant groups. I want to read you a couple of quotes to help put into context how far this debate has has shifted. The first one, the same from the same person. Rather than talking about putting up a fence, why don't we work out some recognition of our mutual problems, make it possible for them to come here legally with a work permit? Same same person. I believe the idea of amnesty for those who have put down roots and lived here, even though some uh, some time back they may have entered illegally, is a good one. Those are both statements from Ronald Reagan. And during the GOP debate last week, one of the hosts brought up how different all of the candidates on the stage sounded from Ronald Reagan, who they all admire, and they were at the Ronald Reagan Center from for whatever, um, and uh, how he had granted an unprecedented amount uh, of amnesty during his. His presidency. So if even Reagan can acknowledge that there's this root cause issue here, why are we getting such political uh, kind of um, interaction here from both parties? And why is there a focus on a kind of a, a heightening these draconian border policies that themselves have shown no evidence of minimizing the incentive for people to want to migrate to escape these conditions? Well, Bree, I agree with you in terms of uh, reducing the incentives, uh, helping countries in uh, south of the border uh, become more prosperous and safe. Um, so there isn't this need to migrate. But you know the politics of migration are very complex. You know um, they do not often cut between the traditional left-right um, dichotomy here. Uh, if you look at who's demanding. Uh, more work permits uh, for Venezuelans and, and, and lobbying every day for more migration. It's big business. It's uh, the Chamber of Commerce. You know, the, the most powerful CEOs in this country uh, presented a letter to Biden earlier this year asking for more work permits. It's the big farming industries, landscaping, janitorial, uh, slaughterhouses, uh, food services, restaurants uh, that are demanding uh, more migration because they've faced a uh, a tight labor market over the last few years. Uh, there's because of uh, you know a labor shortage. 
they've had to raise uh, wages. More migration means lower wages for, especially for um, uh, low skill uh, uh, labor uh, markets, uh, especially in agriculture and, and other fields. So, you know, rather than looking at this simply as a left right issue, uh, we're seeing uh, a demand from big business uh, to bring in more migrants. That kind of cuts against the traditional base of the Democratic Party. Um, this is a party that used to be uh, representing the the working class of uh, labor unions. Um, that's changed now with with the Democratic Party more reliant on uh, highly educated, upwardly mobile, uh, urban and suburban workers who aren't necessarily affected by the you know wave waves of migration from Honduras or Venezuela. They're not competing for the same jobs, but there are many low wage. Americans uh, who are facing pressure uh, from these uh, these waves of migrants, whether that's uh, through social services, um, through migrant camps being set up in their neighborhoods, or simply the, the labor market. So, Lee, just to respond to that, two things. One, that's not really responsive to the core question of whether or not to prevent people from migrating in the first place by addressing some of our foreign policy decisions. My question was about, uh, in part, about getting at the root causes so that people don't migrate, which doesn't have anything to do with big business, except for the extent to which big business is interested in fueling a military-industrial complex that makes the conditions in these countries so well, terrible. The, the big and business then two, wants more migrants. Right, I mean, this, that's part of the incentive. They, right. they, they, you know, there are slaughterhouses right. that are advertising so in, in Mexico the, and Central America calling for more migration that, because the they want point, a cheaper and more pliable work. Yeah, but Lee, to your second point, that's money. exactly why we should be standing as leftists solidaristically with farm workers and migrant workers so that they have comparable pay and rights as American workers so they're not able to be used as a wedge issue to divide us politically, right? Isn't that the whole point of all of the farm workers' movements that we on the left embrace so heartily? So I completely agree that they can be weaponized in this way against the interests of American workers, but that's a labor rights issue, not a fundamental issue about whether or not people who are seeking amnesty under our amnesty laws, one, should be able to have that right, and two, whether the U.S. has an obligation to look itself in the mirror as to why people who would much rather in most cases, stay at home where people speak their language and where their family lives and where their culture resides, have the opportunity to do that without risking uh, violence or economic precarity, right? This being a labor rights issue is a issue around power, around, you know, if you look at the politics around this, how do you stand in solidarity with low wage American workers who are faced with thousands and upon thousands of uh, low wage uh, competition from south of the border from from these these migrants um you know if you, you compare slaughterhouse uh, uh, salaries here in the united states compared to other countries social democratic countries like denmark and australia slaughterhouse workers where they're unionized and they don't face this pressure from migrant workers are paid much better uh, paid much better in australia and, and denmark they have better uh, uh benefits uh, they aren't faced with this constant deluge of competition uh, from from migrants, you know, we, we don't have a Democratic Party that represents these working class voters. Um, we don't hear Biden talking about uh, the, the economic competition that these low wage workers are facing. And yes, we do need to address these foreign policy issues. We, we don't want uh, trade policies that dump American corn and other agricultural products in South America that disrupts um, you know, local farming economies and, and, and might compel workers uh, to flee and, and move north and, and, and migrate. Uh, we don't want these sanctions on, on Venezuela that, that crush their economy and, and, and compel migration. But the core issue here is also economic. Um, the, the wage competition is real, and it's part of what shapes Biden's response on this issue, that Biden uh, confers with, with big business. He's conferring with the CEOs of big companies that are tired of this tight labor market. They want to lower wages. They don't want to keep in increasing wages, and migration is a big part of that. Yeah, I think that's true, and that is a bipartisan effort, as we've seen historically. Republicans and Democrats both have wanted to do that. So I'm a little confused about what the uh, end goal here. My initial question, if you recall, was the maximalist view, even taking the maximalist view of what Republicans want, which is just to keep shipping people back, shipping people back, maybe killing some in those razor wire um, 
concoctions that they put in the Rio Grande, but just shipping people back. Is that tailored to actually getting the influx of migrants to dwindle because the conditions in their home countries improve? And how many Republicans are lockstep with Democrats in the war machine and imposing sanctions on countries like Venezuela? Well, I've, I've responded to the sanctions question several times now, but if you look at any social democratic country around the world where the center left is ascended in uh, Denmark, uh, in Australia, even in, in Mexico, you know, Mexico uh, does not have as lenient immigration policies as the U.S. in order to uh, support workers. You know, for Mexican factory workers working in automotive and other factories, um, they don't allow uh, illegal immigration, immigrants from Venezuela or Honduras to come in and compete with those workers. They would much encourage those workers to come actually up to the United States because they're trying to keep their wages up and support the Mexican middle class. Same with the Danish middle class, same with the Australian middle class. We have some of the most lenient immigration policies in the world. And the reason for that is the influence of big business, of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the, the fortune, the, the business roundtable, which lobbies both parties uh, for lenient immigration policies to bring down wages. Yeah, and I think it's also really worth, clear sorry, economic I'm terms. sorry, Jessica, go ahead. I'm sorry. It doesn't seem that we're in a place where we've reached productive capacity in the United States. We still have plenty of land, plenty of materials, plenty of machinery to put to use. It seems to me that it's an intentional policy on behalf of the corporations to make it so that there's a surplus of workers so that they can keep wages and benefits low. It doesn't need to be this way. We don't need to limit public spending with interest rates. Instead, what we could do is allow a lot of capital to be freed up so that businesses can grow and actually support the influx of workers that we would receive over the southern border. We could be more productive, increase GDP all the while. We could keep wages high. We could regulate corporations so that all workers are paid a very fair and livable minimum wage. It seems to me that this altogether is just an unwillingness to regulate corporations and allow wages to increase all the while it's entirely affordable for America's largest corporations, especially the multinational corporations that have seen record profits over the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you think that there's just an unwillingness among Republicans to regulate corporations and that's really this, the, the end game here? That's really where the migration policy conversation ends when we realize that that's what's necessary? I think that's a big part of it. I mean, the, the Politics of migration are complex. You know, there is kind of a nationalistic, xenophobic dynamic where, you know, voters in both parties don't want to see an influx of people that speak a different language that, you know, might might look different from their traditional communities. Um, that's always been the case in throughout American history. Um, but there's an economic dynamic as well. You know, labor unions have historically uh, opposed mass migration for the the wage reason. Um, you know, if you look back in the Bush years. It was Bernie Sanders who helped kill some of these uh, work permit uh, immigration based uh, work permit based immigration bills because he was standing alongside uh, the labor unions that were concerned about the, the wage dynamics of, 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 of big corporations seeking these temporary uh, work visa programs as an effort to, to bring in a, a lower wage workforce. So, you know, there's a cultural dynamic, there's an economic dynamic, and there is also a foreign policy dynamic that, you know, because of our trade policies and sanction policies, uh, we, we have perhaps uh, destabilized countries in, in the global south. So, you know, we have to look at all these issues across the board. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty big one, especially since you have conservatives from oil rich states um, like Senator John Brasso, who just in August uh, issued a, a statement saying exactly why we should not lift sanctions in Venezuela, which is largely about uh, suppressing their uh, oil industry and having oil dominance in the United States. So truly, it does seem, again, it, we have an asylum law that we tend to be very proud of in this country. I did not immigrate to this country. I'm a descendant of uh, chattel slavery. But most people who are here now came after my people arrived because of our very generous immigration policies that have been um, uh, flexible with certain groups and inflexible with other kinds of groups. Uh, black Americans are disproportionately, have disproportionately been hurt and stigmatized because of the influx of European immigration over the last 150 years or so. And yet, as a country, We've decided, we've been blazing on the Statue of Liberty, that this is one of our values. So I think it's very important not to entangle amnesty programs that give people who are, are qualified for our amnesty programs to become American citizens, have all the rights and interests of American citizens, and not compete with workers.
worker, American workers. That's not a labor issue. That's about whether or not those people become American. And some of these other policies, which I agree, do have serious labor impl implications. But the reality of those labor implications don't actually stem the tide of uh, immigration. And so if you actually want to address the root causes of immigration, Sending boatloads of people back is not going to change the tide unless those root conditions are actually changed, which is why I do think it's important to look at why it is that there is a bipartisan consensus that is led by some of these conservatives and oil-rich states to pursue uh, sanctions on places like Venezuela, at the same time that I think that you're right about some of the um, desire to have um, uh, seasonal work programs that are geared toward dividing the American labor force and extracting, um, uh, minimizing the labor power of uh, lower income workers at the, at the bottom rung there, Lee. I want to give you the last word. Well, look, uh, traditionally uh, in dealing with immigration, uh, Democrats have been able to do both, to talk about ways to accommodate um, undocumented and asylum seekers and refugees here, and also um, create a penalty, a, a disincentive for immigrants of uh, considering the journey to the United States. You know, if you've been deported once or twice, you might not make the journey again. If, um, if there's in enhanced border security that might discourage you, that's what Obama did. That's what Clinton did. That's what other de the Democrats uh, from across the board have done historically. Uh, now Biden is not encouraging any, not providing any disincentive. He's only providing an incentive saying, hey, if you come here, you might receive a work permit. Um, that might be the reason we're, we're seeing such a, a big flow of migrants at the moment. I'm sorry, what's the Biden policy uh, regarding work permits that differs from Donald Trump or Obama's policy regarding work permits? The 500,000 Venezuelan work permits that were just issued uh, l less than two weeks ago, um, that's really been the, the one kind of big immigration policy that we've seen the last few months as we've seen an unprecedented flow of migrants at the border. Um, when Biden was speaking at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, gala uh, last month, he gave a big immigration speech. Um, no discussion of enforcement, no discussion of border security, no disincentive for the migrants coming here, only a discussion of how much he's going to do more uh, to welcome migrants into this country. That's an, uh, that's, um, a, a, that's an approach that's not um, historically the norm for Democrats. Democrats used to do both, both border security and uh, finding uh, pathways to legalization for migrants that are here. And so that, that's kind of the point of my, my column that we're discussing here. Uh, Democrats have, have shifted from the norm. Uh, they're not doing anything in terms of uh, enforcement or, or security. They're not providing any disincentive. Uh, they're only providing an incentive uh, for migrants to come here. But to be clear, you're saying that the policy instituted at the end of last month, the, this new work permit policy, is what has been the cause of the influx of immigration that we've been seeing over the past two years? I'm saying this is a, a welcome mat. This is, if you're, if you're a migrant considering the journey from, from Venezuela and you see that the, the president is not calling for a greater enforcement, he's simply uh, providing more legal work permits, up to 500,000. Uh, I think my, uh, people considering the journey are rational. They're seeing that this is a president that is only providing accommodation, not enforcement. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Lee. Mm -hmm.